Hello and welcome everyone to a bonus sixth briefing of our series, Farm Bill in Focus. Our look today continues uh, with climate smart research for the farms of the future. I think that is just a great briefing title. Thanks to everybody for joining us today. I'm Dan Bursett. I'm the president of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. ESI will actually celebrate 40 years of policymaker education work on Capitol Hill next year, uh, and we have uh, covered so much ground since then, uh, and it all is culminating in the next uh, couple months, for this year at least, with a continued emphasis on policymaker education to help congressional staff answer the tough questions from their bosses uh, about climate topics, like the Farm Bill, like the COP28 negotiations, like the UNFCCC negotiations, like advanced weather forecasting, like the status of the Inflation Reduction Act in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And that's what EESI does, policymaker education. And over the years, we've also developed some expertise providing technical assistance to utilities in rural areas that wish to provide inclusive on-bill financing programs for their customers. ESI is probably best known for briefings like today. Um, sometimes we're in person on Capitol Hill, sometimes we're online, um, but our briefings are always designed to be timely and relevant and accessible and practical. Our last outing was all the way back in July, on July 18th, when we did, uh, or we presented the 2023 Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Policy Forum and Expo. Um, that event featured six panels covering clean energy topics from energy efficiency to sustainable transportation to energy independence. We've also covered topics like the DOE programs to advance nuclear, uh, nuclear energy, uh, energy efficiency renewable energy programs at the Department of uh, Energy, um, green hydrogen with our friends at the Environmental Defense Fund, organic agriculture with our friends at the Natural Resources Defense Council, and so much more. One of the great things about EESI is that our educational resources are always free and available to everyone, including congressional staff. All you have to do is visit us, visit us online at www.eesi.org, and you can find all of our briefings, all of our articles, all of our fact sheets, uh, and even our podcast. The best way to keep up with all of the stuff going on here at EESI is to sign up for our biweekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. I said four words earlier, timely, relevant, accessible, and practical, and that's what really this briefing series is all about. Uh, we've put a lot of thought into these resources to ensure that they're science-based and ready when congressional staff need the information. Uh, just with respect to the Farm Bill, in addition to briefings like the one today, we also have dozens of legislative side-by-side-by-side -by -side -by -side comparison charts we have uh, that will, um, when we get text from the House and the Senate, they will help congressional staff compare what's being proposed. We also have articles. We also have a really impressive hearing tracker. If you'd like to go back and revisit any uh, agriculture committee hearings that dealt with climate topics, we have you covered there as well. And we even have special editions of our newsletter. Um, our philosophy is much, it's much better to have this information before you need it and certainly before your boss asks a tough question about a climate change topic. I hope when you get those tough questions, the first thing you think of is www.esi.org, because I bet we could help you answer that question. Today, our panelists will explore the latest advancements in agricultural research, technology, and practices, as well as how to invest in, scale up, and evaluate what is already working to achieve even more. As climate change continues to trigger extreme weather of increasing frequency and severity, Farmers and ranchers are looking for innovative techniques to bolster crop resilience and ensure food, secur food security. Uh, research in areas ranging from drought-resistant crops to carbon sequestration and precision agriculture can provide new ways of mitigating and adapting to climate change. Research programs and partnerships supported by the Department of Agriculture are generating creative, climate-smart solutions to enhance resilience and reduce greenhouse gas emissions on farms and ranches. We have a tremendous panel lined up for you today, but we are also very pleased to present a special guest. Representative Kim Schreier has represented Washington's 8th Congressional District since 2019. Prior to being elected to Congress, Representative Schreier was a pediatrician in Issaquah, working with children across the Puget Sound region and helping families navigate the healthcare system. As the first pediatrician in Congress, Representative Schreier uses this expertise to inform her work on issues that improve the lives, health, and well-being of children. Representative Schreier is a member of the House Committee on Energy and Commerce, and she has degrees in astrophysics from the University of California, Berkeley, and medicine from the University of California, Davis. Thank you so much to Representative Schreier for joining us today on our online briefing. 
Thank you very much for the opportunity to virtually welcome you to the Congressional Briefing on Agriculture Research hosted by the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. The speakers assembled here and the experience and valuable perspectives they each bring are impressive and important to addressing the pressing agricultural research questions of today and how they inform practices on the ground now and into the future. I really wish that I could be there with you today to listen and learn from this robust discussion. Uh, but I am sorry that I can't, and I will provide a few quick reflections. Agriculture, conservation, and climate smart practices are extremely important to this country, to our farmers, and have multiple benefits. Our agriculture industry is vital to our nation's long-term strength and security. Our agriculture industry employs thousands of hardworking Washingtonians and is vital to our nation's long-term strength and security. And finally, in the face of a changing climate and increased pressure on our food supply, we must support farmers in any way we can and make sure that we have resilient crops that can sustain a changing climate. Now, we did some of this last Congress with the Inflation Reduction Act's nearly $20 billion for conservation programs, a transformative moment for U.S. agriculture to address climate change and agriculture's role. And by directing funding to the voluntary conservation programs that farmers are already well acquainted with and are currently massively oversubscribed, agriculture can be part of the climate solution. There's work to be done and our ag research facilities need to get the funding they need to stay at the cutting edge. Uh, we need to address our deferred research maintenance backlog and increase investments in the next generation of agricultural research. This research is critical as farmers in my district face daunting challenges from hail in June to extreme heat. For example, the ability for researchers to conduct experiments on plants under various environmental stresses is critical to understand crop responses to new climate conditions. Modern facilities uh, can also help researchers screen new crop varieties and understand the impacts of a changing climate on insects and diseases. Many farmers in Washington state and across the country rely on the tremendous research being done at public land grant universities like Washington State University in our state. Ensuring that they have modern facilities, world-class facilities will make it easier for them to attract and keep world-class researchers. This investment will reposition the United States for long-term success competitiveness and leadership in global agricultural and food research. This is why I was so happy to join with Representative Mann from Kansas to introduce the Ag Research Act, a bipartisan bill that will increase federal investment in agriculture research institutions. This bill solves this issue by authoring, authorizing $1 billion in mandatory spending and authorizing an additional billion dollars in discretionary appropriations over five years to provide the infrastructure grants to agricultural research facilities. These institutions discover the solutions to agriculture's most pressing challenges now and in the future. They're fundamental to successful food production and soil health during this time of extreme weather patterns novel pests, and drought. For far too long, these institutions have been underfunded, putting us at risk of falling behind the rest of the world if we don't make these investments. I was proud to introduce this bipartisan legislation that will invest in research institutions and provide much needed assistance for our farmers. And I'm gonna do everything in my capacity to make this happen for the 8th District. Lastly, this is a farm bill year and we need to put forward a bipartisan bill that brings us together, not one that divides us. Whether we represent rural farms or big cities, uh, like I do in the 8th District, the farm bill makes a huge impact on the lives of all of our constituents. Trade, climate, nutrition, rural development, research, forestry, and so many other issues are covered in the scope of this bill. The challenge before Congress is to listen to our constituents, 
and make sure we are shaping a final bill that can pass into law while providing supports to agri agricultural producers, uh, protecting nutrition programs, investing in our rural communities, and supporting sustainable agriculture and forestry. Thank you again for this invitation and I wish you well in today's session and only wish that I could be there with you. Thank you. Well, thanks to you, Representative Schreier, for joining us today and sharing your thoughts uh, and uh, congratulations on the introduction of your bipartisan bill. Uh, thanks also to your great staff who helped make your participation today possible. Um, two things that Representative Schreier mentioned that I would just like to say a quick forward uh, as follow-up. One is the breadth of topics uh, before us as, the, as Congress um, uh, continues its debate uh, around the Farm Bill. Uh, we've covered a lot of those topics. We've covered briefings. Uh, our Farm Bill briefing series has included process and sort of how the Farm Bill goes and how it uh, opportunities for um, staff to help their, their bosses uh, engage productively in the process. We also covered economic environment win-wins. We covered conservation. We covered forestry. And we covered rural development. So if you're learning about these issues for the first time, uh, or you need to learn about them very quickly, or get uh, sort of uh, the um, uh, the best uh, and and be best and most recent information about these topics, uh, you can check us uh, check out this briefing series online at www.esi.org. And my colleague Dan O'Brien just put that briefing uh, list up. It's pretty impressive. Um, we also um, have all those other resources, hearing trackers, um, and article series, and podcasts, and things like that. Um, our four remaining panelists, however, will be with us for the next hour and 15 minutes or so, and I'll introduce them in just a moment. But before I do, you, um, our online audience will have an opportunity to ask them questions after the fourth presenter. And if you have a question in, your, in our online audience, you have two options to submit it. Uh, the first is you can send us an email, and the email address to use is ask, that's A-S-K, at EESI.org. Or you can uh, hit us up on the platform formerly known as Twitter by using the handle at EESI. ESI online. And if we um, have too many questions, we always uh, give a little bit of priority to the ones who reach us, reach out to us on social media. Um, but we'll do our best to get to all of our questions uh, from our online audience during that Q&A. That brings us to our first panelist of the day. Dan Rato is the Director of Food and Agriculture at the Breakthrough Institute. Uh, Dan's work examines how public policy can support environmentally and socially beneficial agricultural innovations, such as methane-reducing cattle feeds and alternative proteins. Dan has led multi-stakeholder projects to identify technical options to decarbonize agriculture, assess federal policy gaps and opportunities, and build coalitions to advance climate-smart agriculture. Dan, you've outdressed me today, uh, but I'll allow that to happen, of course, because I can't wait for your presentation. Take it away. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you everyone so much for your interest. My name is Dan Rato. I'm the Director of Food and Agriculture at the Breakthrough Institute. We are a nonprofit that identifies and advocates for technological solutions to environmental challenges, including in agriculture. And I'm going to provide an overview today on the importance of agricultural research, climate mitigation, and touch on the two or three key research programs that are instrumental in developing a more climate smart agricultural system. Next slide, please. Publicly funded research and development, or R&D for short, has historically been a key driver of productivity growth, providing really the scientific foundation that farmers and companies build upon to develop new crops, new animal breeds, new types of equipment, uh, new farming practices, and more. These innovations in turn enable farmers to produce more food with less, less land, less labor, even less fertilizers, pesticides, and other chemical inputs in many cases, as well as fewer greenhouse gas emissions. That in turn reduces food prices and enables US farmers to remain competitive internationally as other countries increasingly uh, grow their food systems and become more productive. Because of these impacts, every dollar that's spent on public R&D in agriculture has historically generated about $20 in value to U.S. consumers, producers, and the broader economy. And on top of that, federal agricultural research is a primary um, source of support for work and research on environmental natural resource management. 
the benefits of agricultural R&D for productivity and their contributions to developing more environmentally friendly practices enables each investment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions at a cost of about $12 per ton of CO2 equivalent, make, making agricultural research investments highly cost effective relative to many other types of federal climate investments. Next slide, please. Despite this value, despite the historical importance and the current importance of agricultural R&D investments, we've seen public spending, both at the federal and state level, stagnate and fall about one third in the past 20 years. Meanwhile, funding in other countries has significantly continued to increase with China recently outpacing US in terms of becoming the global leader and top funder of public agricultural research. Next, please. This, however, is reversible. One of the main opportunities to reverse this trend is the Farm Bill, which supports research and extension or farmer education through one of its 12 titles, Title VII. The Farm Bill primarily authorizes programs through this title, which then have to receive appropriations or funds through the annual spending process. However, there are a couple programs um, that are authorized in the Farm Bill that also receive their funds, their appropriations directly through the Farm Bill through what's called mandatory funding. These ultimately account for a really tiny portion of the total Farm Bill budget, less than 0.2% of all mandatory spending. They're a drop in the bucket in the Farm Bill. But nevertheless, these importance are these programs are critical to agricultural researchers and to agricultural innovation, climate mitigation in general. Next. The Breakthrough Institute has estimated the amount of funding that goes from these agricultural research programs and other agricultural research programs at the federal level to projects, to research projects related to climate mitigation. Due to differences in methodology, you might see different estimates later today in our presentations or elsewhere, but nevertheless, these numbers in this chart in front of you are illustrative of what some of the main programs are that drive the most climate focused research. Within this alphabet soup of programs, you can see a couple highlighted in red that are dependent on the Farm Bill and also critical to agricultural climate mitigation. On the box on the right is AFRI, the Agriculture and Food Research Initiative. It's USDA's primary flagship grant making program, providing grants to universities and colleges and other types of institutions throughout the country. And the box on the left is the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program, or SARE, which our next presenter, Christy Borelli, will present on in more detail after me. Both of these programs, SARE and AFRI, are authorized in the Farm Bill, but then annual funding for them is provided through the annual spending process. However, one program highlighted in the middle in red, the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research, FAR, is dependent on funding itself from the Farm Bill. It receives mandatory funding through the bill, and it's not part of what's called the, the baseline of the Farm Bill. It doesn't receive permanent funding, meaning that it requires its funding to be renewed every farm bill simply to continue operating. Given its importance for the climate and for climate smart research and its dependence on the farm bill, one of the topics today, I want to dive into it in a little bit more detail. Next, please. The Foundation for Food and Ag Research, or FAR, develops public private partnerships with a wide range of institutions. You can see the breakdown in the pie chart on the right. It involves partnerships with industry, with universities, uh, philanthropy, nonprofits, and other organizations 
to support research really throughout the food system. Um, topics range from soil health to animal health to breathing the next generation of crops. And through its partnerships, FAR is able to secure about $1.40 in non-federal funds for every $1 in federal funds it's awarded, meaning it's more than doubling the impact of its research and funding. And compared to many other programs, a larger share of FAR's budget supports climate mitigation. The Breakthrough Institute has estimated about 30% of the budget and FAR's grants go to projects focused on climate mitigation and FAR itself estimates that number is closer perhaps to 40%. Finally, many of these projects are immediately relevant to farmers and industry because of the tight partnership between FAR and those organizations. Next, please. Now, what's the, the scale of funding that we're talking about here? Uh, FAR is relatively small compared to many other research organizations, um, compared to NIFA, the National Institute for Food and Agriculture, for instance, uh, which has a over a billion dollar budget. FAR has um, basically split its funding received about $200 million in the first farm bill in 2014 when it was authorized and a similar amount in the 2018 farm bill. Puts that funding over basically five year increments. So on average, it's funding about $40 million, a little bit more per year in awards and expects to grant about 60 million in federal funds this year in 2023. And it's on track to ramp that up as more organizations, more partners in the industry work with it and as researchers continue to apply for funding. Um, but that's only possible, of course, if the Farm Bill maintains uh, funding for the program in the future. Now, I wanna talk about one other program too on the next slide. Next, please. Uh, the uh, Agriculture Advanced R&D Authority quite the mouthful, I call it AGARDA for short. Um, AGARDA is a pilot research effort that was established in the last Farm Bill, the 2018 Farm Bill, to be modeled after advanced research organizations and other agencies like Department of Defense and their DARPA program, or Department of Energy, and their ARPA-E program. These programs and other agencies have been instrumental the funding high risk, high reward research that the private sector isn't willing to undertake and invest in itself because of its, of its technological and market riskiness. However, DARPA is famous for being instrumental in the development of the internet, GPS, many of the components and technologies that underlie consumer goods like the iPhone. A similar program in agriculture would fund projects that also fall outside the scope of existing agricultural R&D programs and that also don't fall within the range of projects that the private sector is willing to undertake. Now, I, I bring this up in today's webinar focused on climate because Congress mandated that AGARDA, among other things, help overcome barriers to the development of technologies that can enhance environmental sustainability. And so if AGARDA was to be reauthorized or stood up in some other way, it could provide significant support to climate smart agriculture. But providing top line funding for programs like AGARDA or FAR is not the only thing that's important for climate smart agriculture. Next slide. It's also critical that agencies and programs use their existing funds to support key research areas within climate mitigation. There's already significant funding for climate smart research, but it really pales in comparison to what's needed. A recent Breakthrough Institute report estimated that federal agencies spend about $240 million per year 
on climate mitigation and agriculture. And USDA itself has similar, though lower estimates of how much it spent in 2022. To put that into perspective, that's 35 times less than the US spent on clean energy innovation. Besides that, there are also many gaps within the existing allocation of funds to agricultural climate mitigation. So this chart in front of you highlights one of them at the very top, enteric methane, otherwise more colloquially known as cow burps. It received no more than two or 3% of all agricultural research funding focused on mitigation. But enteric methane accounts for something like one third U.S. agricultural emissions. So it really has received disproportionate funding relative to its contributions to climate change. To wrap up, I would just say that public research and therefore the Farm Bill is ultimately critical, not only to improving the competitiveness of U.S. farmers and to keeping food prices low and further lowering them, but also to equipping all producers, large and small, organic, conventional, likewise, with the knowledge and the tools to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, sequester carbon, and ultimately steward our environment. Thank you for your time. Next slide. Thank you, Dan, for a great presentation. Lots of really great information uh, in your slides. Um, a reminder, if you'd like to download Dan's slides, you're welcome to do so by visiting us online at www.esi.org. Um, all of the presentation materials uh, are available uh, there. You can also go back and watch um, the archive of the webcast um, if you'd like to revisit um, any of um, our presenters today. Um, Dan was also nice enough to recommend some additional resources, and we've posted those on the web page as well. So lots of great information if you'd like to go back and take a deeper dive into what Dan was just talking about. Our second panelist of the day is Christy Borelli. Christy is the Associate Director for the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program that Dan just mentioned uh, at the Program National Office. In this role, Christy leads the National Reporting, Communications, and Coordination, of Coordination Office to develop educational resources for farmers and guide USDA grant programs aimed at supporting farmers and those who work with them. Prior to this role, uh, uh, Christy was a Penn State University Extension educator specializing in agronomy and the SAIR Pennsylvania coordinator. Christy, welcome to our briefing today. I'll turn it over to you. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Great, thank you, Dan. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Um, next slide. So Dan was really, he gave a great overview of federal programs um, in general. And so that's allowing me to focus specifically on SARE, which again stands for Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education. So I'm gonna go over very briefly our history, give you a little bit about our SARE grant programs, including our topics for funding. Then I'm gonna to touch on the future of SARE a little bit, kind of what we're hoping, but we'll probably get into that more in the question and answer than what I'll do in my presentation. Next slide. So the, Sarah is part of the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, NIFBA is our parent organization. So we are in fact a USDA organization. We're 100% funded through USDA funds. And we are a farmer driven grassroots grant and education program. And those words stick out on purpose because that's our mission. And that is really the core of our programs is to remain uh, based on what farmers needs and driving our research and education from that grassroots base. We started in 1988 and we operate in all states and territories across the United States. Next slide. And so in the 1985 Farm Bill is when the term sustainable agriculture, which eventually became the term sustainable agriculture was addressed in USDA programs. Up until that time, it really wasn't considered. Um, and it arose as a need to specifically reduce farm input costs and appropriate types of technology that were focusing more on conservation, energy, um, technologies, and some resource management. Basically, we wanted to look more at holistic farming systems and use integration and methods of managing farm systems and entities to reduce the dependency that we were having on chemical inputs outside our 
on, uh, sorry, outside farm inputs, such as chemical fertilizers and pesticides. Next slide. So in 1988, the first USDA program that funded sustainable agriculture came into place and it was called LISA, the Low Input Sustainable Agriculture Program. And it was funded at 3.9 million as part of the, the 1985 Farm Bill at that time. Next slide. And then in 1990, the, during that Farm Bill, the program that is now SARE, or very close to what SARE is today, was born at that time, and it was put into place. And SARE operates under two chapters of the Farm Bill. Basically, uh, Chapter 1 is our Research and Education Program, and Chapter 3 is our Professional Development Program. Professional Development, understanding that farmers and their cooperators, the people working with them need education in sustainable agriculture, whether it be as a concept or be, uh, specific practices. And so that's more of a train a trainer type program that got added to, to our programs. We do have grants focusing on it, but we also have um, some, that's our education portion. We also had chapter two, which was never really instated. I'm not sure why, but we basically operate under the chapter one, research and education, and chapter three, uh, professional development. Next slide. So this is a snapshot of uh, Sarah in a nutshell on one slide. Um, we operate again, as I said earlier, in all the states and territory, and we're managed through four basic regions. We have five main offices. The first is the National Outreach Office, which I'm the director of, and we're based out of the University of Maryland. And we do reporting, we do communications, and we do coordination. So overall sort of pulling everybody together, but we do not have any grant programs out of this office. The grants are managed through the four regional host institutions, uh, represented one per each region that you can see from the colors, the Western, North Central, the Northeast and the Southern. And it's really important, and this is part of our legislative mandate too, that we have administrative council. So each of the four re regions manages their grant programs through administrative councils, which is a very unique and important aspect that SAR has. The administrative councils are about 20 to 25 members per region, and they are a committee of volunteers. And some of those seats are legislated to be uh, representatives of government agencies such as the EPA, the NRCS, but also a lot of those seats are also filled with by farmers and people who work with farmers, uh, extension folks, or a lot of people wear multiple hats, so they're serving in the capacity. And that's where the grassroots part of our programming comes because the administrative councils are the ones who uh, deem the programs that are important for funding. They set the funding levels, they set the grant programs, and they're able to focus on what type of agriculture is important for each region. As you can imagine, all the regions, all the states are very different from one another and they need to be adaptable and flexible. So the administrative councils are the, uh, the uh, the, the organizations that make the decisions for the grant programs. I also wanted to mention the staff. Uh, behind each of those five stars is an amazing committed staff um, that works directly with SARE to manage our programs and provide support to our grantees. It's another unique factor that we have for our grant programs. We all work on some national committees. And I also mentioned the professional development program earlier, which began in 1994. So each state and territory has a state coordinator or somebody dedicated to working with SARE in each state. Okay, next slide. And because the regions are so different, it's very important for us to allow them to be flexible, to adjust to different cultural practices within each region and state, environments, uh, at different communities and different needs. However, with that said, so they all manage their own grant programs differently. But with that said, we have five that are fairly similar across all the programs or across all the regions, excuse me. They're the research and education program. We all have farmer rancher programs. We have on-farm research or partnership programs, graduate student programs and professional development programs. And so when we look at the audiences of of those programs, we do see research in there. The one thing I wanna say about research is that we, although we do it, it's very applied. 
very rarely are we doing research that's done for research sake. It's very applied and it's very applicable to farmers at the time. And oftentimes in the programs that farmers are required to be working with the, re the researchers on that topic that's extremely important to them. So again, building up that grassroots capacity that's farmer focused in all of our programs. Uh, we have educators and I use the term service providers here too. So those are any partners who, such as extension agents, educators or NGO representatives who work with farmers. We also give grants to all of them. And for the longest time, I'm not sure that this is still true, but again, focusing our, our recipients of our grants are not all researchers per se, but they're representing that whole community of, of farming. Next slide. So this is a snapshot of our, of our funding history over time. I mentioned in 1988, we had gotten 3.9 million is where we started and we've moved up to 2023. And Dan mentioned also in his presentation that we, we do receive annual appropriations. We currently do not have mandatory funding. Uh, up till this time, we have received $662 million in funding. And when we look at our grant projects, 412 million have gone into, gone out through our grant programs. And I just wanna add there, that's not all the 2023 funds. We're still offering those awards right now. So that number is a little bit low. We're gonna expect that 412 to go up. And it is important that most of our money goes out into our grant programs where it's doing the most good and where it's needed the most, but the, any remaining would be going into our education and outreach programs, as well as some of the staff support. Next slide. And so when we talk about topics for our grants, it's very rare that we would, or our administrative councils would ever allocate a specific topic for funding, for example, climate change. Um, again, we want the grantees to be setting the priorities of what is appropriate to them to be studying and learning. And that's the approach we've taken since 1988. And so this is just a snapshot of topics that we funded. It's certainly not entirely comprehensive, but you're gonna see if you look through here, a lot of the topics that when we talk about climate change for mitigation and adapting to climate change and resolving concerns about it are addressed here on farm renewable energy, rotational grazing, cover crops, a lot of the social issues that are affecting agricultural producers and their communities are being addressed here. So although we don't often fund climate change specifically, we are addressing them through our practices. And I believe we've been very successful with that. Next slide, please. And this is sort of a reiteration of what I just said there. So when we look at our database, um, just searching a term like climate, and I, I search for climate, and then I adjusted to focus more on the factors addressing the climate crisis as opposed to cold, hardy crop climates, for example. And the results are a little underwhelming when you consider our history, but 4.7 million has gone into climate specific projects and similarly regenerative as in regenerative agriculture, we had $1.9 million going into it. And these are projects from 88 to 23. And when you look at the data too, you'll notice that, that these two topics are clustered toward the top. So the majority of these projects are kind of rising to the top since 2018 and not represented through our whole profile. Next slide, please. And then this is looking at their funding by topic. And this is just addressing, again, just a snapshot where we have soil science-based projects. So soil health cover crops, organic matter and carbon. And we're looking at the funding here and you're noticing that it's much more substantial for soil health and soil cover, cro or cover crops. We had 23 three to $22 million in funding where organic matter and carbon had 19 to $17 million in funding, many more projects. And these are all extending all the way through 1988. And you would imagine similarly looking at different topics that I had on that original list, we might see clusters of our funding coming this way. Um, so we've really been focusing on sustainable and climate mitigation factors for a long time. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is where we are now. Um, we, we would like to be increasing our annual appropriations for SARE. We are slated at $60 million. We have yet to reach that. And we would like to, that is a goal of our organization to get to that point. With that money, we would be issuing more grants, covering more topics, possibly higher amounts going out to grantees, possibly more integration or interaction among grantees and offering them support. 
We've also been addressing quality of life factors or the social sustainability factors more in our programs. That includes improving our diversity, equity, inclusion efforts and realizing where we've um, been set back with those and how we can improve that. We would also like to be providing more technical assistance for grant management, acknowledging that not everybody writes grants or does that manages them on a day-to-day -day basis and it's very difficult. So how can we offer that support without uh, having a conflict of interest on our part? And we're also getting better at evaluating program impact. We have a project going now that's addressing that. Next slide. So these are our resources. If you're interested, go to our webpage, sarah.org. If you want to look at our projects, uh, projects.sarah.org. And I'd be happy to receive a message from any of you. So thank you for your time. That's great, Christy. Thank you very much. And in addition to reaching out to Christy using her contact information, our online audience today will also have an opportunity to ask her and our other panelists questions. Uh, as a reminder, you can ask our panelists questions two ways. The first is by sending us an email, and the email address to use is ask, that's A-S-K, at EESI.org. You can also follow us on the platform formerly known as Twitter, at EESI Online, and hit us up that way. Our third panelist today is Lawson Connor. Lawson is an assistant professor in the Department of Agricultural Economics and Agribusiness at the University of Arkansas with research in extension appointments and crop production economics. Lawson's research focuses on the intersection of farm risk management and farm finance, including biotechnology, crop insurance, farm financial resilience, and conservation practices in agriculture. Lawson, great to see you today. Welcome to our briefing. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dan, and I'll share my screen so you can see. Um, so good day, everyone. Um, thanks for Dan and Christy for introducing the funding side of this, and I hope I'll, I'll be able to branch into some of the research aspects of what we've been doing. And so I'll be focusing on some of the research that we've been conducting and uh, ending with some of the, the, the grant uh, the, the grant sponsors that have been able to, to fund this research with the aim of continuing to, to see these types of funding come, come our way and, and towards other types of research with similar impact. And so I want to start us off with sort of the, the bigger context of, of where all of this research uh, is uh, sort of fits and, and sort of come from. Um, and so that would be kind of farming in the context of um, the, the ecosystem and how it in interacts with the ecosystem. And so we're seeing this idea of, um, the, of, of farming having both external and, and internal concerns. Um, some of those external concerns would include nitrate pollution, um, eutrophication, uh, hypoxia, um, dead zones, et cetera, and waterways. Uh, so th those are some of the impacts that would um, kind of happen downstream of, of the actual um, farm itself. And then we have things that are uh, occurring uh, within the farm as well. So soil erosion, nutrient leaching, increased um, yield sensitivity to um, extreme weather, such as drought. Um, and those are becoming more and more concerns, especially in the context of climate change. And as those uh, climate impacts become more and more severe, we're seeing that these potentially can have um, um, greater effects over time. Um, and of course, uh, there's also interactions with the Farm Bill itself. And some of the research we've done, I've tried to isolate some of the interactions with the Farm Bill. Crop insurance has come up a couple of times in terms of um, its, its uh, um, uh, interactions with, with cover crop adoption or even with, with drought sensitivity. And so with that backdrop, we look at uh, what are some of the implications for um, farming in general, and of course, for administering um, farm programs. And so when we're looking at these um, increased uh, sensitivity to drought from, from yield um, uh, resilience or lack of resilience uh, through climate change, through other impacts, we're seeing that potentially we would have um, increasing um, um, uh, expenses for administering farm programs. We're looking at the uh, USDA report uh, summarizing, uh, an AgriPulse report, I should say, um, summarizing USDA RMA data, um, looking at indemnities over time. Um, and we're seeing that uh, those indemnities uh, fluctuate 
uh, but I've had an increasing trend at least um, in the last uh, five or so, or, or so years. And part of that is due to increased acreage that is enrolled in, in these farm programs and in crop insurance especially, but we're also seeing other aspects that could be contributing as well. There's been research that's been documenting greater sensitivity of um, our crops to, to drought um, and several reasons that have been proposed for those. Um, and of course, um, work that, that I've done personally has looked at the interaction of um, crop insurance with uh, 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 yield risk and expansion to, to um, lower quality lands. And all of those interactions um, tend to have the effect of increasing the cost of administering these farm programs, crop insurance in particular, but other farm programs, disaster programs, especially, um, uh, especially that would also be um, potentially more expensive over time. And so we enter the idea of diversified cropping systems. Many of us have heard about cover crops. Um, the research we've been conducting has been looking at this from uh, sort of an ideal case where we, where we what we would think these farming systems would ideally look like. And we don't think that these, these ideals would necessarily ever be achieved, but we're thinking of these components in, in terms of how many of these components can be incorporated into our cropping systems. And the reason that we're looking at it this way is because we have an understanding from the scientific research of this, of all the effects that they have on soil health um, and the ability to uh, create crop resilience. And so when we're looking at this diagram, we're seeing, um, uh, especially on the right, on, on the left over here, sorry, um, different aspects that can be incorporated into farming systems that can promote some of these beneficial effects. So we're talking about um, increased water retention, which would be um, uh, important for, for drought. Uh, as we were talking about, those impacts have been increasing over time. And, um, you know, we're, we're seeing increased um, uh, retention of nutrients, and with, which, again, give us that increased resilience that we're looking for. Um, crop diversification, uh, livestock integration, organic matter amendments, minimum uh, disturbance. Many farmers, um, especially the large row crop farms, are going to no-till, so that seems to be much more um, uh, incorporated into our farming system these days. Residue retention and continuous living root. And that's, this is kind of where cover crops would tend to come in. And so we're looking at this from sort of a, with how many of these components can be incorporated into a farming system and looking at it from a very holistic standpoint. And so with that, we've seen that uh, conservation spending or spending towards specific practices has gone up. Cover crops has gotten the lion's share of attention. Um, and we've seen that the, that the spending towards uh, conservation programs has increased over time. And as I said before, cover crops have been one of the, not necessarily detailed here, but uh, has been one of the, the, the major, the, received some of the major funding when we're talking about um, conservation, conservation spending. And so this is where sort of the research questions necessarily come in asking these broader questions of um, what are the internal or, or are the internal benefits sufficient to drive adoption? Because despite seeing um, increased spending towards um, or increased funding for uh, conservation, we're still seeing very low adoption um, for these um, practices, cover crops included, or cover crops especially. As I said, no-till has been increasing much faster than cover crops. Cover crops for uh, many areas still remains relatively low. And so the question becomes, uh, number one, are the internal benefits? So if we can reduce drought impacts, if we can increase the amount of nutrients in the soil and, and the host of benefits that we think exist, are those gonna be sufficient to drive adoption of, of these practices. Um, can adoption mitigate the risks that we're thinking of? So as, as, we, as we do see um, increased or, or potentially increased um, drought risk or perhaps extreme weather risk in general, uh, do we see that those um, practices, do they have the potential despite giving those, those benefits? Do they have the potential to actually show 
um, um, results in terms of resilience of, of those crops. And so that's sort of a, a second major question that we, we try to tackle. And then the third one, I think, is, is a very important one, is these, this idea of heterogeneous impacts. Do we expect to see that these practices may have benefits in some areas and, and less so in others? And does that help us to understand how to target funding in, in any way, whether that be private funds um, or public funds? And so those are some of the drivers, the, the large questions that we see as our research program, uh, as part of our research program for how we would want to um, conduct uh, research. And so the research that we've been doing has been focusing mainly on the internal concerns of uh, row crop agriculture. We've been looking at um, crop diversification, so increased rotation, um, continuous living roots through, through cover crops, minimum disturbance through no-till, and residue retention through a combination of these, um, which will increase organic matter amendments. And in addition to looking at the, uh, at the adoption of these practices, we're looking at whether these actually have economic benefits at all, whether they be on the farm or um, externally through um, the reduction in the amount of spending that the, that the um, farm bill programs um, have to administer. And um, of course, uh, a, a very important one as well is understanding and mitigating any kind of unintended impacts of, of government funded programs towards um, uh, um, farm, uh, farming system, whether that being, um, uh, you know, increased um, misuse of programs or, or, or any kind of other um, effects. So some of the selected outputs that we have have been looking at these specific issues. One of the ones that was recently published was one looking at um, how cover crops have interacted with prevented planting. So prevented planting is something that is related to crop insurance. It is um, one of the um, one of the endorsements in the in the crop insurance program that is specifically related to early season um, uh, issues. And so, in the early season, prior to planting, if you uh, experience wet weather or perhaps too dry weather or any kind of weather impacts that impede planting uh, during that time, then prevented planting would step in. Um, one of the issues with uh, measuring the, the effects of wet weather is that not only do we not see, um, it is difficult for us to report or even estimate what the effects would be because it can be very heterogeneous, but the, the, the biggest issue is that we have missing data. So we have lost crop acreage that is difficult to account for. So preventive planting is one way that we can use to, to um, to figure this out. But not only is it a, are we able to figure out whether we're having an impact or a reduced impact from those cover crops, we're also seeing those expenditures from the crop insurance uh, portfolio. And we were able to, uh, or some of my colleagues were able to show that um, preventive planting was uh, reduced as a result of, of those cover crops. But the research doesn't really stop there because a bigger question to this is, is this universal? Do these effects, um, are, are they going to be similar effects if we move, say, our research outside of the Midwest and go towards other areas? I'm currently um, located in Arkansas. And there are questions about whether cover crops would have those effects in, in, in an Arkansas environment where we plant much earlier and we have to terminate much earlier as opposed to the, um, the, the Midwest. And so because of this heterogeneity, these are essentially first steps in really understanding how these practices can be applied nationally and whether there are any kind of selective um, um, uh, practices that we can use that are tailored from one, from one region to another. Um, other types of research that we've conducted has, in, is, uh, has included um, the interaction of the programs and um, incentives of um, individuals so this research here, looking at the um, effects of crop insurance on, on yield risk. We also have ones looking at the uh, interaction of crop insurance and, um, and cover crop adoption. 
And of course, we've been looking at the, um, the effectiveness of the conservation payments in terms of increasing adoption as well. And so all of this research we think um, is important to continue to expand our understanding um, and of course, improve the efficiency of dollars allocated towards um, farm bill spending. Recently, we were able to attract two um, funding, uh, two, two, two grant awards, one from AFRI and one from FFAR, um, as, as was introduced earlier. Um, those were directly related to some of our um, sustainability um, aspirations. We've been looking at um, the financial system really um, as, a, as a key driver for adoption. And so we've been looking at tools that we think can be used by lenders to help understand the risks or risk benefits or risk mitigations that might be offered by these practices and incorporate those into this into the decision making process for either lending or um, or setting setting interest rates, et cetera, et cetera. Those, this work is obviously in the in the early stages. This this was awarded to us earlier in the year, but I think that these types of um, of, of um, awards help drive these types of research and innovation forward so that we can continue to the, the march towards um, understanding how these how these practices work, how they fit into our systems regionally and nationally, and how we can continue to improve the, the, the efficiency of delivering these, these practices towards farmers. And so with that, I will um, leave it there. I want to make sure I mention my partners in all of this work. Uh, Landcor, which is a, a 503c um, nonprofit organization that we, um, in partnership with them, I was able to, to um, get the, both the FFAR and the AFRI grants for developing those tools. And I also want to mention um, my collaborators at NC State as well for the good work that they've been doing um, and that we've been doing jointly on a lot of these sustainability issues. Thank you, Lawson. Uh, that was a great presentation. Um, lots of great information. Uh, as a reminder, anyone who would like to go back and revisit Lawson's presentation or review uh, his presentation materials, you're welcome to do that by visiting us online at www.eesi.org. Thanks to everybody in our online audience for submitting questions. We'll do our best to get to as many of those as we can when we get to our Q&A. Thank you. My name is uh, Tracy Morgan. I am with the Kalispell Tribal Extension Office for Washington State University um, under the Kalispell Tribe of Indians uh, program, FERTEP program. I'm going to talk a little bit today about something called the Federally Recognized Tribal Extension Program, which we call FERTEP for short. FERTEP is a, a very uh, unique program uh, created to, to benefit tribes and agriculture, natural resources, and, and other areas. Um, but it was it was began and initiated due to inconsistencies uh, across the country of, of county extension, county cooperative extension, not serving tribes as readily as the rest of the county uh, constituency. So prior to FERTEP, county extension offices were not serving reservation and tribal communities to their to the capacity they were other other um, communities. So in 1990, um, the Farm Bill included a program for TEP to address these inequities in agricultural extension so that Native American farmers and ranchers would have access to the expertise, support, and programming under other USD and uh, extension programs. Agriculture Agricultural extension supports Indian country uh, in a sovereign to sovereign relationship. Uh, tribes petition for and apply for grants to become a FERTEP tribe with an extension office of their own through the land grant university system. The land grant universities develop memor memorandum of understandings between the tribes and the state to uh, lay the groundwork for a FERTEP to occur. 
there are only 35 FERTEP offices across the country where there are hundreds of reservations and tribal community. And so 30 years later, FERTEP has still not reached its full potential for, for benefiting tribes and Native American community. FERTEP has been narrowed down to three main categories of assistance and support for Native American communities. The first is positive youth development programs, including 4-H for tribal youth, which often, often has a very strong agricultural component. The Native Farmer and Rancher Productivity and Management Program, which supports tribal producers, ranchers, and farmers with uh, USD and NIFA programs that, that really uh, increase the success rate of farms in Native American communities or on reservations. And third, Native Community Development which is a very broad category, which encompasses a, a few of the programs above, but also includes everything from addressing childhood obesity to uh, native plant propagation. And so today, this the three or four topics that may have been of most interest to you are food systems, farm and community markets, and food sovereignty. Um, how all this, uh, relates to adaptation to climate and environmental changes and how tribes contribute to knowledge held by ancient indigenous, indigenous cultures to perhaps revolutionize or, or create innovation in existing agricultural systems. So climate change or environmental change as mentioned in FERTEP uh, are already having very dire impact on reservation and native communities. Uh, extreme water shortages, drought or flooding are impacting all of us across the country, but often reservations are located in marginally irrigable lands that are often either already arid or remote or, or in rocky or mountainous country, making it difficult um, to to have high productivity in agricultural systems in the first place. Uh, soil integrity and loss is also an issue. Uh, statistics show that uh, soil moisture across, across the scale is being impacted. And this has consequences for all crops and even range and uh, uh, cattle foraging. We're faced with inconsistent logs, which are the last and first uh, frost dates and length of the growing season. This has been observed and also impact crops and farms and food system. Uh, the livestock disease and expense has increased drastically and puts a lot of pressure on reservation and other farmers and ranchers. It, can exacerbate disease uh, primarily in the diseases that are in subtropical or other climate zones can migrate into areas that are not accustomed to dealing with those diseases or pests, insects, or even invasive plants. In short, climate change will disproportionately impact Native American lands, reservations, and communities. So regenerative agriculture is uh, not a foreign concept to Native American communities. Uh, they've long been privy to the innate knowledge of regenerative practices, largely to their very close ties and intimate knowledge of the environment. These have been around for centuries and in some cases, even thousands of years. A uh, few examples are um, drainage and irrigation systems in the Southwest, uh, storage systems in the Northeast, and uh, just a myriad of other techniques. Uh, at present, most of these activities are done on small and localized scale, but have potential to be expanded to benefit society at large and to be brought back and reinvigorated on reservation lands. Indigenous traditional ecological knowledge can help shift practices 
toward more sustainable production nationwide as well, because these techniques often take into consideration uh, perpetuation and propagation of plants and even uh, animal animals, even beyond cattle, such as bison, that um, are considered, you know, tens, dozens, even maybe hundreds of years into the future. So I wanted to mention a few of these ITEC indigenous traditional ecological knowledge practices. Uh, many of them have become mainstream in perhaps small scale gardening, but are uh, also now starting to be integrated into the larger scale farming and ranching. Multiple cropping, no-till farming, uh, companion planting, uh, which is putting plants together that actually have natural inhibitors for pests or disease invasion, and uh, treat soils for plants uh, adjacent to them, following fields, resting them, uh, staggering the time of plantings so that um, nutrients are not exhausted, uh, maintaining separate plantings of different varieties so that uh, varieties are maintained and not uh, contaminated, and polycultures where uh, several plants may be planted exactly all together in the same location. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what we're doing in the Calafell Reservation. Uh, our funding usually averages about 100000 a year, but um, with a creativity and uh, lots of partnering, we can do a lot with that money. And, and this is the amount that most FERTEPs get across the country. Um, but it's, it's just an essential program for, for helping keep uh, tribal programs that are uh, tribal government uh, run and uh, financed, uh, supported and, and um, sustainable. So one, one such project is a cover crop uh, on a, a plot of soil to both really uh, learn the soil composition in the valley where the reservation is to get a good soil profile and the characteristics and growing uh, potential there, but also to pick um, cover crops that can help keep soil viable and the cover crop is being carefully chosen to be a native plant, so that helps sustain native plant communities adjacent to it. But also these plants could be of interest culturally and traditionally as food crops as well, and um, conserve pollinator, local uh, solitary bee pollinator communities. So there's some symmetry to, to the project that is not just one one topic. Uh, the second is a hydroponic outdoor system where um, perennials are being grown for food. Uh, Indian Creek has a huge nursery for trees and other shrubs for remediation of landscapes after wildfires, but we are now starting to see native plants as an, as an incredibly important ag agricultural product and as also a cultural entity, um, both serving to help feed, feed the community. The third is uh, a study on forest gardens, which would have edible plants intermingled with uh, native plants in riparian zones to help restore cold water fisheries and also provide food and um, learning laboratories for, for young, people to go out with elders to learn the characteristics of plants, trees, and foods. So in this sense, we can see agriculture as healing, healing relationships between uh, the US government, between land grant universities and tribal communities, and within tribal communities uh, as uh, a source of sovereignty. Farmer and rancher programs can be culturally based, such as having bison. I don't have a picture of bison here, but um, bison are very important uh, livestock 
uh, source for food, but are also pathways to restoring culture and tradition that have uh, gone almost to the brink of extinction. And so supporting these programs does a multitude of uh, benefit for the tribes. Uh, community, uh, these forest gardens or solar plots, community gardens, uh, these are places where community can gather and learn about native plants. They can learn about other just food sources, just classic gardening and get interested in healthy and whole foods. And uh, not last but not least, adaptation to climate change. Uh, because tribes will be disproportionately impacted, uh, the regions will be very interested and engaged in how the country uh, uh, approaches dealing with climate change. Uh, and in one way, we could go back to ways that have uh, not been very healthy for the environment or the planet, or we could look beyond and explore the uh, techniques and ethics that Native American communities have had in care for the land for thousands of years. So in, in conclusion, um, to quote the NRCS, uh, rooted in indigenous wisdom, regenerative farming is an alternative decision-making decision -making framework that offers a set of principles and practices to grow food in harmony with nature and heal the land from degradation. And that from our own uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service. Uh, the 35 federally recognized tribal extension programs serving Native American communities are assisting in providing food security for select tribes across the country already. If expanded, these programs have potential to serve all reservations where food insecurity is high. It is imperative that agricultural systems change and adapt to climate change. ITEC practices can and are already contributing, and FERTIP is primary in supporting this interchange of knowledge. So if you have any questions or would like uh, more references, uh, feel free to write me, tracy.morgan at wsu.edu. And almost all my resources and sources were cited from these, uh, these links here. And um, I could provide a lot more where these come from, or if you'd like to talk about um, some of the projects that are ongoing on this reservation, please just write me a note. Thank you. But before we get to our Q&A, uh, we get to hear from David Hayes, our fourth panelist of the day. Uh, David is a lecturer of environmental law at Stanford Law School and senior fellow at the Natural Resources Defense Council. He served in the White House as special assistant excuse me, special assistant to the president for climate policy. And prior to advising President Biden, David was executive director of the State Energy and Environmental Impact Center at the NYU School of Law. David is a former distinguished visiting lecturer at the Stanford Law School, a former fellow at Standard University's Precourt Institute for Energy and Woods Institute for the Environment, and uh, the Senate confirmed deputy secretary and COO at the U.S. Department of the Interior for Presidents Barack Obama and Bill Clinton, and he's chairman of the board of the Environmental Law Institute. David, welcome to our briefing today. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Uh, thanks so much, Dan, uh, and thanks to your team, Anne McGinn and others, uh, for putting this important briefing together. Uh, please, uh, out there in uh, YouTube land, don't be put off by the fact that I'm a lawyer. I'm really a policy wonk, as many folks know, and my interest in these issues really uh, peaked in the last couple of years uh, in the White House with the president working on climate-smart agriculture issues in the broader climate context. And I wanna share some observations and thoughts that, that I've been working on since I've left the White House a few months ago. So next slide, please. Uh, so the climate smart uh, uh, moniker here for agriculture is extremely important as, as all the speakers have really touched on. 
because we all know that agricultural practices can have significant climate impacts, both pro and con. Uh, on the pro side, of course, there's excitement about sequestering more carbon dioxide in soil through good soils management practices. And, and this is a real plus. Um, I personally uh, uh, cringe a bit at, at, the, at too much focus on the climate side of, of the importance of carbon dioxide sequestration. Uh, because the co-benefits are extremely important as well, and I think need to get uh, equal or even sometimes more billing than the, the, the climate side, uh, in part because it's very hard to accumulate more carbon dioxide uh, in soils, and it happens over a, short, a, a long period of time. Uh, meanwhile, methane and nitrous oxide emissions uh, are, are incredibly important and significant uh, 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 con sides of agriculture, if you will, which means there's opportunities for farmers uh, to reduce uh, both both types of emissions uh, and potentially get payment for it, frankly. Um, and methane and nitrous oxide are, are in terms of their uh, 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 greenhouse gas impact, much more significant pollutants than carbon dioxide. Methane is uh, about 30 times more powerful Nitrous oxide is literally 300 times more powerful than carbon dioxide in terms of greenhouse gas impact. And uh, methane in the near term is an extremely important uh, emission to be reduced, emission source to be reducing uh, because it, 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 because of that power, uh, it's it, in fact uh, a third, a quarter to a third of, of all of the greenhouse gases that are now excess in the atmosphere are are from methane molecules. Um, and, uh, and, and the agriculture sector is the single largest emission source of methane in the United States. It, 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 uh, from enteric fermentation uh, and also from uh, manure management. Uh, together, uh, the emissions from those uh, uh, agricultural practices uh, trump uh, the emission sources of the oil and gas industry, methane sources, which we're hearing a lot about. And, and nitrous oxide is really a, a sleeper here, but it's 7% of the emission sources in the U.S. and 80% of nitrous oxide emissions are coming from, uh, from fertilizer uh, and from uh, uh, soil decomposition. Uh, so it's, it's also an opportunity uh, for the, the industry. Um, you know, the good news, the good news part of the story is that is the multiple benefits side. Uh, of good practices that have good climate impacts, but also uh, important uh, other uh, advantages for, for farmers. Higher yields uh, for many of them, reduce costs for precision agriculture, as for example, on the fertilizer side. Also cover cropping uh, and other smart practices uh, make farms more resilient in the face of climate impact. And of course, um, there, there, there are folks interested uh, from the USDA and, and the uh, uh, third parties about uh, providing incentives to farmers to do these things. Um, but all of it is dependent upon showing some results, which is the, a primary purpose of my talking to you today with some, uh, some ideas in that regard. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of the statutory and legal framework, for incentivizing climate smart ag practices. I wanna to point to a few. These are familiar to all of you, I'm sure, but just to put them on, on a slide here, um, it's been mentioned earlier about the nearly $20 billion in funding under the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which has been allocated to USDA for existing conservation programs, but based on a, an assumption that is laid out in the statute that the Secretary of Agriculture will confirm their climate benefits associated with this funding. And we know instinctually that that's true, uh, but that's the first signal that we actually need better data to confirm uh, against baselines, for example, how much actually increased climate benefits we're seeing from the, the uh, allocation of these funds on landscapes. Uh, and in that regard, the IRA, uh, explicitly earmarks $300 million uh, to, uh, for measurement, monitoring, verification, and reporting of carbon sequestration in soils or methane and nitrous oxide emissions reduction. Those words very explicitly in the, in the statute. 
And for those of you who have been following this, uh, the USDA on July 12th uh, released uh, an early assessment of the kinds of things that it's thinking about in terms of MRV approaches and data management approaches. Um, then the Partnerships for Climate Smart Commodities Initiative, many of you know, actually has a huge focus on measurement and monitoring. Uh, the, 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 the whole thesis of Secretary Viltek's initiative here is that, um, uh, that, that uh, consumers will be willing to pay more for agricultural commodity products that have been produced in a climate smart way using practices that are known to confirm, that known to sequester more carbon in soils, reduce methane and nitrous oxide emissions, for example. And the program was designed in cooperation with, with our Climate Policy Office in the White House uh, to focus on measurement and monitoring because that is probably the most significant uh, a negative impact in terms of, and the, the lack of it, uh, in terms of, of properly monetizing and, and rewarding farmers for these benefits. The data simply aren't there. So a lot of these programs were, uh, were the, the funding was granted in part on the creative and uh, thoughtful new approaches for testing and for measurement and monitoring generally uh, to prove out the benefits and to prove out the thesis that uh, that to some extent government subsidies can be produced by what might be a more reliable income source for farmers, namely higher prices uh, for, for products that are produced in climate smart ways. Uh, the president, of course, started out with a strong climate smart agricultural uh, lean in, in in his very first climate uh, uh, executive order 14,008 on January 27th. And interestingly and importantly, the omnibus budget a uh, law that was was enacted uh, and signed into law in January of this year uh, is looking to USDA to be more active in this area to identify widely accepted protocol sampling technologies uh, uh, with a recognition that that in today's world uh, payments are not being made to farmers in a reliable way through voluntary carbon markets in, in large part because of the lack of confidence in in current protocols, in current sampling methodologies. And, and what are we going to see in the new Farm Bill? I hope these issues will be uh, addressed because there's a huge opportunity to do that. Next slide, please. So, so my thesis is, as you can tell, there's really a need for better MMRV of climate smart practices in ag. We, we, uh, the, um, Currently, this is difficult and expensive, uh, it, it, and it's not been invested in, and new technologies have not been picked up. Uh, this is hard to do. Uh, obviously, heterogeneity of ag soil uh, is, a, is a problem, uh, and there's just been underinvestment in ground truthing of technologies and methodologies. There hasn't been the, 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 uh, the incentive structure available to do this, uh, and as a result, um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, we're, we're behind. Uh, but now we are facing potential or, or have the prospect of potential incentive payments that are putting into focus on climate and sustainability practices across supply chains. So you've got agricultural producers and farmer suppliers wanting to confirm and validate climate benefits for these potential incentive payments. And from a personal perspective, and I suspect from many farmers' perspective, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, ag agnosticism about whether the, the incentive payments come from conservation program uh, payments uh, by uh, USDA, uh, market-based uh, payments, uh, market uh, uh, price payments at the, at the register, if you will, uh, 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 by consumers, uh, or potentially voluntary carbon markets. All of them will be under-realized unless there's better uh, essentially uh, confirmation of the climate benefits. Um, and and, uh, and uh, so, uh, next slide, please. So these are the factors that are holding back and improved MMRV for climate smart practices. First, USDA has invested in broad-based models developed by a number of terrific land-grant universities, um, uh, uh, but they're, they're stale. Uh, and, they, and they are models that were not designed uh, with climate in mind. 
with with carbon, with with methane, with nitrous oxide. Uh, they they have a limited uh, calibration. Uh, they they uh, common uh, common farm, for example, will just give positive results, uh, and they simply are too gross uh, in terms of their fidelity to, uh, to confirm that practice A, B, C, and D will provide. Uh, uh, results within an acceptable and understandable and confirmable range of, of results. Uh, also, the USDA has focused almost exclusively on carbon uptake in soils uh, and very little effort in, in the methane and nitrous oxide. And when it comes to greenhouse gas benefits, it's the latter that where the, the big upside is in terms of uh, reducing emissions. And finally, the, the, the lack of, of strong USDA-sponsored uh, models, and confirmatory data, practice pro protocols, et cetera, has left the field open for uh, entrepreneurs and companies to do uh, their own uh, uh, versions of what should be done. So, and, and many of them are, are, are putting proprietary uh, uh, sort of labels on this, and, and you get black boxes in terms of of companies that will will make payments based on uh, kind of a trust me uh, uh, concept, um, and and the voluntary carbon markets have been have had a rough go of it here in part because of the lack of transparency in terms of the data. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, so we did a report at Stanford with the help of really some really smart PhD students, uh, business school students, and law students. Uh, and and I, I view this very optimistically. There's a historic opportunity for USDA to address these uh, deficiencies. Uh, and I mentioned why here in these, these points. Um, let's go to the next slide. So, how, so, so among the things that I think are, are important here is for USDA to, uh, to continue to focus on specific agricultural practices. Uh, to, to identify what these climate smart practices are and, and get consensus protocols on them for soil carbon, uh, nitrous oxide, and, and methane. Without those consensus protocols, and that Congress has called for it as well, we're, uh, we're going to have trouble. And as to those consensus protocols, we need some baselining and some regional uh, testing to confirm uh, expected benefits from them with periodic verification. Um, so, uh, and, and then the question is, a huge question is, how does USDA, uh, if they can get these models uh, 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 modernized and better calibrated and, and associated with specific practices, what data are available, not just to USDA, but to everybody, particularly if we're talking about voluntary carbon markets and, and, uh, and outside payers, uh, and supply chain uh, uh, issues to, to verify that data. Um, the, there needs to be a comprehensive plan around data collection and analysis. And USDA knows this, and they're struggling a little bit, I have to say, I think, in how to, uh, how to manage it. Next slide, please. A final slide here um, are some specific recommendations from our report and our ongoing discussion. Uh, with a lot of stakeholders uh, and, and many of you on, uh, on this YouTube. Uh, uh, we need some outside experts to help USDA here. Uh, this is a huge, uh, challenging uh, situation and opportunity. Uh, they're, they're talking about a national soil monitoring network, which is great, uh, but we've also got to give equal or even more attention to the methane and nitrous oxide. Um, and the, the data management platform and mechanism issue is extremely important. The White House has identified this as not just an issue for agriculture, but for forestry and for all greenhouse gas emissions, methane from oil and gas industry, for example. The U.S. is about to put enormous investment uh, into uh, uh, reducing emissions across the entire scope of uh, the emissions that are causing climate change, and yet, there's, there's no way, no, no one place or no one way to uh, get data that can be shared across all interested parties here in anonymized formats uh, that will provide the kind of transparency and potential marketability, if you will, of uh, reduced emissions. Uh, that, and that's going to 
hold back our, our entire climate effort. Um, so um, excite, exciting about what we can do here, particularly with anonymized data as shown by organizations like the Farmers Business Network, et cetera, recognizing the privacy interests, but, but taking into account what's happening uh, in, in regions and, and with various practices. So uh, uh, I wanna get to the questions. I'm gonna stop here. Uh, obviously a couple other uh, uh, important recommendations there. I hope you'll take a look at our report and, and follow these issues and love to talk offline with folks who are deeply engaged in them as well. Thank you. Thank you, David. That was great. And um, if anyone would like to go back and revisit David's presentation, the materials will be online as uh, well as a link to the report. Um, thanks so much for that. That was really great. Um, I'll invite Dan and Christy and Lawson to turn your videos back on and we will get into our Q&A. Um, thanks to everyone in our online audience uh, for asking some questions. And um, I'm gonna pluck a few out of um, those that have been submitted. And uh, David actually kind of following up where you left off talking about measurement and verification and, and that topic. Um, one of the questions came in um, sort of dealt with how do we know we're getting sort of maximum benefits? Uh, how do we know um, that we're that we're actually getting the results um, that are uh, that are in line with the level of investment that's going into specific practices, say, for example, cover crops. Um, Dan O, I'm going to, uh, excuse me, Dan O, I'm, that's just habit. Dan R, um, I'm going to start with you because it's been a little while since we've heard you, but I'd love to sort of hear your thoughts based on um, what you've heard today and, and what you otherwise know about this topic. How can we ensure that we're setting these programs up from a metrics perspective to ensure that we're getting maximum benefits uh, and that these investments are in fact uh, delivering what they're promising to. So I think David touched on a, a couple of key aspects here, really ensuring that the tools, both measurement tools, as well as the modeling tools have uh, the level of precision that policymakers require and that companies, carbon markets, and anyone else in the space requires um, but it's not just when it comes to cover crops um, or other practices about measuring carbon, as David mentioned. Critical is also to measure nitrous oxide emissions, and, and in some cases, methane, methane emissions. With cover crops in particular, some types of cover crops do fix nitrogen from the atmosphere and thereby um, can either um, help offset uh, the amount of fertilizer that crops need, or in some cases, increase nitrous oxide emissions from the soil. So we need to look at all of the greenhouse gas emissions involved. And then there are two other pieces, at least, that are important. So one is really incorporating an assessment of the impact of practices on yields. If yields are falling due to a farmer adopting a practice, that means overall more land is needed to produce the same level of food. And if that's happening at scale, it can result in what's called carbon leakage, where farmers elsewhere in the country or world, increase production to help offset that decline. And the third element is really additionality, thinking about whether a federal incentive or, or program um, or carbon offset, if we're thinking about the private market, is that actually leading to a farmer making a change on their farm that they wouldn't otherwise make. And so um, if there are places where cover crops are incentivized by states or required, um, in those cases, a new program might not be additional necessarily. Christy, let's go down through the line and give you an opportunity to share any thoughts you have about how we ensure these programs deliver maximum benefits, or at least the benefits that they're intended to provide. Yeah, you know, I think it's setting people up early. I think this comes down from a technical assistance standpoint too, is getting people set up to be able to ask the questions that they want to be measuring and find the results that they want to be able to get, um, quantifying those and measuring those. But I think also understanding that stories are important too, like the impact that people, you know, the grants have on people's pro personal lives or farms, their businesses, and particularly in the SARE program, we do see that, that maybe three or four years down the line that we might, there might be a benefit that you really didn't set out to, but has really emphasized, enhanced your processes, your practices, your relationships. And I think that really gets into more social science and being able to evaluate 
um, communities and grant users using social science methods as well and seeing what, what are our larger impacts. So that's some of the things that we're doing um, and basically just counting things all along and trying to measure it more appropriately. Thanks. Thank you. Lawson, um, in your work, uh, what steps are you taking to ensure that these um, that these metrics are available and uh, understandable on the part of policymakers? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I think um, perhaps maybe backing up a bit, um, uh, just going back to the original question, I think uh, it really depends on what we're trying to measure in the first place. I think what are the impacts that we're trying to mitigate? And I think um, where carbon is concerned, obviously measurement and additionality are going to be your biggest um, questions. Um, and, and how do you get at those adequately? I think for other areas, I think the Chesapeake Basin area has done a really good job at this. Um, when we have um, local concerns where runoff might be uh, your biggest challenge, um, cover crop adoption, I know there is upwards of 40% um, due, due to local drives and initiatives. Um, and obviously those programs have been effective um, for the purposes that they were set out for, which was um, to mitigate some of that uh, impacts on the agriculture. Um, so I think uh, it really depends on, on what you're setting out to do. And that perhaps might be um, uh, setting up the evaluation of what are the, what are the biggest needs in particular areas and um, giving the practices that make sense for those areas the most. Yeah, these are really great comments. Uh, I, and I agree with, with all of them. Uh, I think Lawson's point is particularly significant. And, and uh, on the soil side, I completely agree that this should not just be a carbon uh, climate uh, sort of calculus here. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, when you, you look at methane and nitrous oxide, um, there, the opportunities are in front of us, basically. Uh, and so the additionality issues, for example, are, are much less significant. Uh, the, the, the potential for a rewarding uh, farmers uh, with practices uh, is, is much higher. And I just want to say, uh, obviously, um, the whole system is burdened by the fact that, uh, particularly in the soils area, uh, regular soil testing that's been uh, required is very expensive and very labor intensive, and, and you can't expect farmers to be doing this, uh, and, and you shouldn't. Uh, two things, one is there's some really cool new technologies that are bringing down a, a, those costs. Uh, secondly, uh, I mean, this is, this is, the government should be doing this on a regional basis to provide sort of much, much more baseline information and, and uh, with, with some regular verification and that sort of thing. And, and I think the opportunity on the methane and nitrous oxide side is to, we're starting from scratch. Let's get some good protocols. Let's take advantage of the research that's happening. And it needs to be uh, uh, better funded as described earlier uh, here today. Uh, and, and, uh, and, 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 and position this in a much better way from the outset. I'm glad we've covered methane. Well, I'm not glad because it would be better if we didn't have to cover it. But the discussion today around methane and nitrous oxide is really interesting. We had a briefing earlier this year. It was part of our Congressional Climate Camp series that looked at non-CO2 emissions and pollutants. And I have a pretty good hunch that we're going to revisit uh, methane in particular next, next year um, as well, because it does deserve a lot of extra attention. Um, Christy, this next question was, uh, I think, inspired by your presentation. So I'd like to start with you, but then open it up for the rest of the panel to have a comment. Um, and the question had to do with how SARE ensures that its grants are accessible. Um, a lot of agriculture takes place in rural areas. Um, there are some capacity constraints, whether it's financial capacities or human resources capacities or information technology capacity constraints in rural areas, how do you go about making sure that people um, in disadvantaged communities or people who might live in frontline communities or environmental justice communities are able to access the grants and other uh, programs that SARE makes available? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that question. And it's something that SARE as a whole is focusing on very strongly right now. And 
It really means getting honest with yourself and really looking at your program. Our mission is to represent the whole of American agriculture and have farmer-based programs. And there's been a couple of times we've looked up and realized that there's some people missing from those programs that we're not doing that. The things we're doing, we're doing really, really well. I don't want to be disparaging with that, but we have a lot lot of places to go. And we've we've done some internal work. And, and part of it is just asking those communities or members of those communities what, you know, it's hard to find who you're missing, right? If you're not there, you know, but but actively going out and seeking them and say, what are some of the limitations with our grant programs, especially in a program like Sarah, these are available to everybody. Um, there are technical aspects. Sometimes we have some opposing viewpoints, like we have a really amazing database that's really important for us as grant managers, as grant users. I just pulled some data off in a couple slides, right? That took me just a couple minutes. So as a user, that's really important for me. However, there are barriers to people entering that data if they have connectivity issues or lack of internet resources. And so again, that comes down to technical assistance. I think a lot of that is, well, first of all, on our end, we can own that and we can say, well, our system need to be more simple. Our questions don't have to be so involved, you know, and that's something we are looking at. We're looking at um, making it a little bit easier to use. But I think the support comes in also from people who are um, you know, who can have access to those things. Again, I mentioned a conflict of interest that Sarah has because we give grants. We can't help people write grants, even though we have all these amazing staff people out in our, our counties. However, we can work with other people who can, you know, work with people who are writing grants and we can offer the support we can. Some of the other things we've we've realized that we we had a definition of a farm which was very convenient but it had to be a thousand dollars of production. We realized that that didn't serve a lot of cultural communities so we changed our definition of a farm because they might not be selling their products for example so they might be producing a thousand dollars of products but it might go back into their um, communities into their families and so it's it's different than the backyard gardener you know they're actually Actually, um, the, they're they're producing farm products, but that was a limiting factor. Um, invoice funding, you know, having some so many people have to put up the funding up front. That's not available to everybody, so that's something we're exploring a little more. So those are some of the methods. But thanks, thanks for that, um, Lawson, David, Dan. Please feel free to chime in about how, um, sort of any strategies you're coming across or best practices about how we can ensure that the next generation of agriculture research or even agriculture research that's going on right now, you know, is uh, is done in a in a in a in an optimally equitable way. Yeah, sure. And I, I I guess if I understand the question in terms of access to that information or funding um, in rural communities, and I think um, uh, being in a land grant institution, I think we do have a play a role in that. Um, through our extension and our delivery programs, and so that I think there is a burden on the on the, um, the the tertiary education institutions to make sure that that we as faculty, as, as extension agents, are getting the messages out there and are interacting with our stakeholders. Um, that also does in, in include um, increased funding for even the 1890s and smaller institutions that might reach populations that we don't necessarily have um, uh, direct access to or relationships with. And I think all of those are essentially where we would see some of that uh, start to take hold. And just to jump in, I think uh, USDA did a great job with their uh, uh, partnerships for commodity smart, uh, 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 climate smart commodities program. Uh, the awards were really uh, uh, the, the the program request took into uh, wanted to hear uh, how that how those pro those, those proposals would would help frontline communities disadvantaged communities folks who uh, small farmers etc and and they worked really hard and I think successfully to have partnerships that that are broad based and that that take into account those those um, uh, factors and. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to see. Uh, it's a lot of money going out in the next five years and some really interesting programs. And of course, the Justice 40 initiative is going to be guiding uh, uh, the, a lot of the climate spending the administration is taking into account to make sure that 40% of the benefits of that spending uh, come to disadvantaged communities. So um, really good progress here, I hope. I'll just 
jump into you know perhaps one or two other things F following up on Lawson's point there has historically been a significant disparity in research funding um, at 1890 or historically black grant grant institutions um, as well as 99, uh, as, as well as the 94 tribal colleges compared to the 1862 um, plan grant institutions there's I think uh, the Center for American Progress had a great report recently on this same topic, finding that the endowments of the older land grant institutions are four to eight times higher on average than for the 18, uh, 1890 and 94 institutions, um, which doesn't just impact uh, the amount of research that the institutions can carry out um, directly, it also has indirect impacts and in that it, it makes it more difficult for your universities and colleges to provide matching funds, which are often required for federal grants. Um, so thereby, 890 institutions have foregone tens of millions of dollars in federal funds because they didn't have sufficient states matching funds or funds from their endowments um, to secure that funding. That, that's a challenge that a couple of bills have recently um, aimed to address in different ways. Um, and then on, on a very different topic briefly, there's also disparity um, in terms of the amount of research funding available for crop versus livestock research typically, um, which has always surprised me. There's a lot less funding available for livestock research, both from the public sector as well as from, from the private sector, even though the value of livestock production in the US is pretty similar to the value of crop production. So that's an, another challenge that I think um, faces efforts for climate mitigation in particular, given the large portion of emissions that comes from beef and dairy production specifically. That's very interesting. If you had just asked me that, I would have intuitively said the opposite, but that's uh, very interesting. Um, we have unfortunately reached time today, and so we need to um, let everyone go back to their um, uh, other business of the day. But um, Dan and Christy and Lawson and David, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing all of your expertise and perspectives with our online audience. Um, everyone uh, really enjoyed it. I think there's a lot of evidence for that in the number of questions we got. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but um, thank you for four tremendous presentations. Um, if anyone would like to go back and revisit any of the presentations or presentation materials, um, you can do that by visiting us online at www.eesi.org. Um, you can also, uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll also have summary notes available. So if you want to go back and say, hmm, I remember something at that briefing about this or that, um, it's uh, a nice way to um, sort of very quickly uh, very accessibly um, catch up with the topics that we discussed today. Um, also like to once again wish uh, Tracy to uh, or share my wishes for Tracy to get well soon. Sorry, Tracy, you weren't able to join us today, but uh, your presentation materials will also be available online and we'll do our best to catch up with you at another time. Um, also big thanks to Representative Schreier for joining us at the start of the briefing. And thanks to her great staff for making that possible. Um, there is a great team here at ESI make, that do all of the work uh, and make all of these briefings possible. I'd like to share a special thanks to Dan O, uh, uh, Dan O'Brien, uh, Omri, Allison, Aaron, Anna, Molly, and Nicole for all of your hard work. Uh, this is also the first briefing of the fall, which means it's the first briefing for our fall interns. Uh, and Zoe, Laura, and Maggie are awesome and also doing lots and lots of work behind the scenes to make this possible. So thank you very much as well. Um, we have a bunch of briefings coming up. If you've visited our website in the last two weeks, you've noticed that there's a lot of briefings posted. Our next one is on September 28th. This will be looking at the latest on the Clean Energy Tax Incentives and the Inflation Reduction Act. We are going to have a monster panel uh, covering energy efficiency, biofuels, uh, green hydrogen, um, electric vehicles, um, all of uh, what well, panelists covering pretty much the entire range of the IRA tax incentives, talking about what they are, how much they are, where they are in the stat of the implementation. Uh, and that will be a briefing that no one will want to meet. We'll be revisiting IIJA and IRA implementation on a regular basis, and that's the next one. Uh, we also have innovations in weather intelligence to tackle extreme weather. That's going to be October 12th. Uh, unfortunately, a very relevant briefing topic. We also will have our uh, COP briefings or um, 
our briefing coverage of COP28 uh, will kick off. We have two um, posted, uh, one about international climate finance, uh, climate, uh, excuse me, called Congress and International Climate Finance. We'll also have another briefing about the global stock take and another briefing about the negotiations themselves. So if any of that sounds good to you, and I hope it does, um, follow us online, um, visit us online at www.eesi.org and sign up for Climate Change Solutions. It comes out every other Tuesday. It's a really tremendous resource uh, and a great way to keep up with what we're up to. This last slide uh, that Dan O just put up is a survey link. If anyone in our online audience would like to take that survey, we take your uh, feedback very seriously. We read every response. If you had any issues with the audio, with the video, if you have ideas, if you're uh, just a little annoyed that your question didn't ask, get gas, that's all fair game for the survey. Uh, let us know what you thought of our programming today. We're always looking for way to improve, ways to improve. And like I said, we really, we really do take all those survey responses to heart. We'll conclude there. Sorry for going six minutes over, but thanks again to our great panelists and Representative Schreier, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. We'll see you back on September 28th in person on Capitol Hill, and from what I understand, in SVC 208 in the Capitol Visitor Center. We just got our room reservation uh, for uh, clean energy tax incentives in the IRA. Thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon.